think that's where a lot of brands who start maybe doing the right thing, that's where they stumble and fall again, is back up for a second and think about real life. Tom, on a Tuesday morning, who's getting ready for his accounting clerk job, does not want to learn about the beneficial ingredients in our whey protein. He does not care. He opened Instagram because he's either on the toilet or in bed too long, and he just wants to laugh at something. It's a force of habit. <laughs> Tom, Tom doesn't care, dude. Tom has kids. Tom has a job. Tom wants to be entertained. And so I think like when we create content, I try to think about Tom a lot. Like I'm like, wh why, why would we sit here and talk about all these other things that the supplement nerds are already going to dig for and we already have backed up for and we built pages for them and we direct them to them. That's awesome. They're taken care of. But like mainstream people, people who are just like normal people that you're selling to the vast majority of the world, they want to laugh. I'm Eric Fulweiler and this is Scratch, bringing you marketing lessons from the leading brands and brains rewriting the rule book from scratch for the world of today. Hey everyone, my guest today is Dylan Jones, CMO of the Challenger Supplements and Sports Nutrition brand, Podium. This is such a good episode. Like I'm telling you, if you're listening to this right now, make sure that you carry through and listen to the rest of the episode. Dylan drops so much knowledge and wisdom. Definitely, if you're in CPG or probably any B2C business, there is so much good stuff in here, but really for any marketer, um, it's just chock full of insights and good stuff. So Podium Nutrition, obviously, um, Dylan will give you the overview, but you know what I think is really interesting is one, uh, they've gone down the route of having influencers on their cap table, so influencers as owners. So we kind of talk about the rise of, you know, the likes of Prime Energy Drink, and then of course there's Rihanna and Fenty Beauty, these influencers and celebrities that are creating or uh, becoming co-owners in their own brand. So they've done that in the niche of CrossFit with Matt Frazier um, and also some kind of big time content producers and influencers in that space. We also talk about the very intentional um, approach that they've taken of starting with the niche of CrossFit, how they've gotten into that space and how they're planning to expand beyond it. And I love how Dylan gets very tactical with here's exactly what we're doing to expand out of CrossFit and make sure that we do it in a successful and a sustainable way. You know, of course, when it comes to sports nutrition, we talk about uh, the importance of brand differentiation, but in a category like that, where as we talk about, you know, whey protein is whey protein for the most part, and creatine is creatine, absolutely. A lot of the differentiation comes down to brand. So we get into that as well. Love this episode. I am definitely going to be re-listening to this a couple times once it comes out. So I really hope that you like it. Check out Dylan, check out Podium Nutrition, and please enjoy our conversation. Dylan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for making the time. How are things where you are in Texas, right? I'm trying to remember from our prep call. Yeah, Texas, good old Dallas. Good. Things are good. Um, good to see you too. Congrats on the rebrand. It, it looks good. I saw some of it on LinkedIn. It's cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And for those who are listening and not watching, I've got the new, I think, fair is this the uh, edition four hoodie now? I think it's edition four. But yeah, the new rebrand, the new logo, which we are very excited about, as if anybody follows me on LinkedIn, you would have heard a lot about this weekend of January. But I really appreciate it. Great to hear it from CMOs because it is, you know, it's the audience that we're trying to reach and influence with this. So. Thank you. Can I do something a little unconventional and ask you a question out of the gate? Is did that create did that creative how did you execute that? Like how much how much like who, who was your editor? It was good. It was good. Okay. Well, Viren, really. Viren is our kind of creative director in a way, our executive producer and also our creative director. But our business, so we're more strategy and less execution. We do some execution on the paid media side, but for the most part, we're doing marketing strategy brand positioning, go to market, doing a lot with customer data, MarTech, et cetera. Um, so we worked with an external partner to do the Viz ID. Actually, the main one that we kind of refer clients to or bring in when we need to partner with someone. So we worked with a team from their side. You know, it is one of those things, if you know the expression, the cobbler's children have no shoes. It's like advertising agencies are usually the worst at advertising themselves. So we're trying we're trying to raise the bar a little bit, um, but I will admit it took us a while. It took us a couple false starts and client projects and everything going on, but we got there in the end. We're really happy with it. So yeah, we essentially had an agency. I mean, they're 
a great partner of ours, so it didn't feel like an external partner. But we had, um, you know, a designer and a creative director that was doing it, but Viren was leading it from our side. I, I, the one thing I noted was, was probably the best use of some stock that I've, like stock footage that I've seen in a while. It was clean. Like the cuts, stock footage is tricky and the cuts are what like make or break it. And for some of those pieces in there, I'm assuming they're stock, if not like, yeah, stocks and it flowed together well, but it was, it was good. Like it was honestly really good. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I mean, you know, I've obviously been in this industry for a long time and worked in full service agencies and creative led agencies and all that. I'm not the creative guy. Like, I don't think I have the, um, I guess kind of instinct or natural talent for it. It's also not really the part of this world that I spent a lot of time in. I was always much more account management, general management, commercial, et cetera. Um, and so, well, I think Varid will laugh when he hears me say this. I feel like I tried to let him do his thing, but yeah, I mean, I can't help it. You know, as a co-founder, I'm like, no, I don't like that color. No, I'm sorry. I can't tell you why. Um, but the biggest thing for me is we always talk about Rival as we want to be premium, boutique, and challenger within our industry. And um, the thing that I was looking for, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, it when you see it type of thing, which I know is super frustrating to hear from clients, but um, couldn't help myself. I was like, I want it to be a big level up. I want it to be much more premium. Um, and we got there in the end. So yeah, I'm glad you like it. Looks great. Good job. Yeah. Good work. Appreciate it. Uh, Varen, we might have to like cut this and just roll it as ads on LinkedIn. I feel like this is probably better promotion for us than anything we've done so far. <laughs> um, but Dylan, let's get into it. So before we talk about Podium and everything that you guys are up to, tell us about one challenger brand you're super passionate about right now and why. This is not scripted. I was wearing this shirt this morning because I like it. Um, but LSKD, if you're familiar, um, they are an Australian-based company super challenging uh status quo as far as like fitness and like fashion forward fitness um their apparel is super solid and i think they will in the next few years be a very relevant name when talking about brands like lululemon they are they are that good their team is strong and i love their design uh their founder is super savvy he's he's scrappy um and so i just i really like i really like their story and what they do with brand identity so yeah, I think they're I think they're going to kill it. They just expanded in the US this last year too. Their team here is in my hometown in San Diego. Um and gosh, they yeah, they're going to blow up. I'm really excited to see that. Awesome. We'll have to check it out. But it is interesting, you know, you mentioning Lululemon like within categories there's kind of it's a constant wave and cycle of challengers you know winning and becoming what we like to call rival brands, of course kind of the new incumbents in the space, but then the new challengers come in and it is cyclical. Like Lululemon, I feel like not that long ago was kind of like the challenger that everybody was talking about. And now it's the next generation. I think about this with Starbucks as well. Um, you know, big coffee guy or whatever, but Starbucks was the challenger brand back in the day. And now there's all of these, like, there's like watch house coffee here in the UK, blank street coffee. I'm like, they're Dis, you know, they're kind of what cha what Starbucks was to the traditional, at least American way of drinking coffee or like Uber. Now there's Wheelie here in the UK, which is kind of like the higher end black car service because Uber is now much more about Uber X. It's just, um, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, like, you know, this is the thing that we're so excited about and is really the, I guess like, you know, the red thread throughout everything we do and like the vision of Rival, why we started was to try to understand what drives the growth of challenger brands. So um, it's just fascinating to see. It's just relentless, you know? I think brands that start with culture first and they're not just chasing this like crazy. I mean, revenue is important. That's what keeps the lights on, right? You need, you need things like contribution margin to stay afloat and prove that you're profitable. Like these things are important, but Brands that can balance that with the need, the desperate need to build brand equity, those are, I think, are the ones that you see go from challenger to, you know, this incumbent kind of position. What's really interesting with Starbucks in particular is that I don't see them going anywhere still. And I think it's because they're, you know, the way that they operate is still, I, they're just good at dominating. They're good at staying relevant. They're good at following trend in a way that's not cliche and yucky or cringy or whatever the word is now. Uh, they're good at staying on top. And I haven't seen anyone notably really challenge. I've seen some, I've seen some people kind of perk up and, you know, like there's the Pete's play and Phil's and, you know, stuff like that. But 
nothing really at that level. That, that was an interesting note. I hadn't thought about that until you brought that up. But yeah, Lulu, just, just the other day, it feels like was 2016 and everyone just started really getting catching fire and wearing them and everyone's wives wanted to spend $300 on leggings. Like, what's going on? Um, and now it's, you have these other brands. I think LSKD is definitely positioned because of their like culture forward methodology. I think they're going to absolutely crush the space. It's cool. Well, I think that's a great segue because I know that's a lot of how you're thinking about, you know, building the podium brand. So for folks who don't know, tell us what we need to know about podium nutrition. Podium nutrition is a modern lifestyle performance brand. Um, it has a very unique look and feel, uh, you know, it's, it's a very kind of like modern retro approach. And at the end of the day, we're selling efficacy and performance for sure, but also just lifestyle and flavor, right? Um, we are trying to make sure that podium is always kind of walking this fine line of, you know, we're not overly educating on product and becoming one of those like education forward brands. We're not overly leaning on like lifestyle a la like a prime where it's just all lifestyle. Um, we're really trying to walk this fine line of like, how do we, what's our 10 year roadmap? And then like, what does the step of today look like with that context? Um, so I think we're doing a really good job on, on labels, on creative, on who we partner with content, but yeah, podium, podium is, uh, is about three years old and it's, it's here to stay and, and here to play for the long term. I think, I think, uh, it's got a lot of legs underneath it. I'm excited about it. So yeah, the, you know, you mentioned prime and I would certainly put you guys in that category in my mind, at least of influencer owned and led businesses. You know, of course, how I found out about you originally is, you know, I'm pretty big into CrossFit over here. And, uh, you guys were kind of born in that space with Matt Frazier, five time champion and the buttery bros who were part of the original kind of CrossFit media team. And then have kind of built their own influencer world, um, in that category as well. So that's actually the place that I wanted to start is, you know, would love your point of view on just kind of, in my mind, it, the original play was influencers have the attention of the audience you're trying to reach. So why not rent that attention? And then I think brands, but probably more so the influencers got wise and they were like, hey, why are we leasing our attention when we could actually own something and started kind of either starting their own businesses or actually getting equity ownership, you know, Rihanna and Fenty Beauty being probably one of the best case studies. Um, but what's your point of view on that, both from within Podium and just as a CMO? And then would love to hear a little bit more to the extent you can share the story of how that came about and how it's working for Podium specifically. I'll say that I'm probably the most positive pessimist that I know. I don't know how else to frame that, but um, the days of I love how you put renting attention are dead. And I think that's best for everyone. Um, consumers very quickly, I think before brands noticed, um, consumers noticed that nothing was really authentic anymore. You could just buy an influencer's attention and use their clout for a day or so or a month or however long your campaign was and spike sales. It's the same, the same, uh, frustration happened with brands, you know, after, you know, it was meta, wasn't a money printing machine anymore. Right. And, and at, you had to actually, you know, build a whole business model that wasn't just centered on Facebook ads. Um, when these things happen, we can get angry or frustrated, but ultimately they're better for everybody because it makes you have to double down on the one thing we always want to ignore and that's, that's brand. Right. And so when we're looking at a structure like podium i think there's a there's a couple caveats not every partnered influencer partner brand is going to do the same things or have the same results you're still at the end of the day working with people right so someone could have 40 million followers and if they're not a great person and they don't have a good work ethic you could fail right you have you you're working with people at the end of the day um, they aren't just influencers if they don't have that ethic to, to carry the torch and really be a meaningful partner uh, you're, you're not going to have a great time. So there is that caveat. The other one is, is that just even if they're great people and they have a great following, if your other portion of the business is not doing well, let's say your flavor is off, or if you're not in CPG, your, your cut and so is off, whatever your product is, if it's not a good product, it'll also fail. Right. And so it's just another strategy. It's not something you want to center your whole business on. And I'm really intentional with that. So talking with like Matt buttery as being owners, Phenomenal partners, amazing people. We just spent the week in Miami. I'm sure we'll dive into that madness, but we just spent the week in Miami with them shooting a bunch of content. And I, I've never laughed harder, like uh, at least in the last like three or four years. Like I, I was sore from laughter. They're they're great people to be around. 
And I think it translates through our content and brand really well. But I've told Paul Haberland, our founder, who, side note, co-founded Ghost back in the day and also was part of the original Nutribull team and brought C4 to market. He knows his stuff. Paul Haverland, um, I told him, I was like, hey, this can never be the Matt Fraser brand. This can't be the Buttery Bros brand. Because if so, you're you're done. Like, you're already done. The writing's on the wall. You're limited. And in my opinion, uh, it's still disproportionately successful because of the revenue they did done. But Prime's biggest mistake is it's the Logan Paul KSI show. The minute those dudes get the minute those dudes get canceled and they walk very close to that edge, it's going to be uh, not a great time to be Congo brands, right? There's there, nothing is perfect forever. And so you have to kind of position yourself in a way that's like protecting the brand and protecting your influencers that you partner with and their bandwidth. On the flip side, let's say it is the Matt Frazier brand and that's all we're doing. He's going to get burned out eventually. He's going to have other interests. There's going to be other things. It's a boring story after a while. So I think when you do any of these partnerships, you have to look at the whole plan holistically, make sure the people are right, make sure your product's right, make sure the strategy is right, and also just don't depend on that person. Um, you know, Rihanna and Fenty is a great example, but they also just have really good marketing and their product's really good too. You know what I mean? It's not just the Rihanna show. So when we're looking at, at Podium, it is a core and a crucial part for how we grew seemingly overnight. But after that, the real strategy started of like, how do we keep this momentum going without dependence on, on these people on the cap table? Yeah. And it's so interesting because, yeah, I think Prime is a great example. Like I know nothing about them besides the fact it's Logan Paul and KSI and it's like these drinks that my teenage daughter wants to pay 15 pounds for and they're disgusting. I tried them. Um, but, you know, it's kind of more of like a, like a, it, I almost relate it to kind of like, um, like a fast fashion. It's like a trend, you know, I feel like it's going to go away. And I always sort of imagine that they're planning on that, but I don't know. Whereas what you're building is, of course, that's why I say it's disproportionate, right? Like if you're if you're going to get the bag, great, you've got the bag, and then so you've got everyone's bag, great. But that's not really that doesn't tickle my fancy necessarily. Yeah, exactly. Whereas you guys, and knowing a little bit from our prep call as well, because I do, you know, personally, I do kind of think of it, if I'm being honest, as like the Matt Fraser brand. But that's like within the world of CrossFit but not to the same level as Prime and Logan Paul and KSI, because I see it pop up in other places. And also, and we'll come on to this a little bit later on, like there's a bigger business behind this of which the CrossFit vertical is a place that you're kind of starting and growing, but you have bigger plans about how to expand beyond that. Before we move into that, I do want to touch on, you know, for people who aren't familiar with CrossFit, let's say Matt Frazier is like the Michael Jordan of CrossFit, right? Uh, like the number one. Um, and then the buttery bros, I mean, I, how would you describe them? I mean, they're like a two man media machine. They're almost like they kind of have the cultural significance in the CrossFit world of like what MTV used to be. Obviously they're not a TV channel, but it's kind of like that. Like in my mind, they kind of like make CrossFit culture. Um, although personally not, not a consumer of their video videos, um, but that's kind of who they are. But anyway, one of the things that you said in our prep call is that getting a elite athlete and a content producer in this system, like on, you know, as part of the business, that was intentional. So can you expand on that? Yeah. So elite athlete, obviously for the efficacy portion, right? We, when we're thinking of podium, we still want to lead with, we're ethical, we're clean, we're reliable, we're good. Uh, you can trust us, right? We're, we're tested. Hey, look, this athlete who won multiple times and this other stable of athletes that trust us because he's on the cap table. They're all taking our products. They're all testing clean, yada, yada, right? The content creation side is for that lifestyle play. And I think before you, before you go broad, it is safe. It is safer to go niche and then plan on expansion from there. And so the way you went over a niche is through content and lifestyle. You have to prove that you're actually one of them. And I'm not. So like when I first joined the brand, it was about a year in. Um, so I'm catching you up to where I kind of joined it now, post them signing on. And uh, I didn't know that CrossFit was its own company. I didn't know that this many people actually did CrossFit. I thought it was just a meme. I also didn't know who Matt Fraser was. I had to Google him. Um, but I was really good at marketing and really good at learning. And so Paul's like, hey, do some homework. Tell me if you want to be part of this brand. And coming from Mary Ruth's and that sprint that I did with them, I was ready for a little bit of a change and something more naturally in my voice. And I'm not completely ignorant. You know, I grew up in in the gym environment. My grandparents were like power lifters. And, you know, I, I've been fit and active my, my whole life. So I wasn't ignorant. But coming in, I was like, I didn't know any of this. So fast forward, 
Buttery Bros actually helped me, like their channel and the content they do helped me very quickly learn what CrossFit was and the story of, of Matt, the story of who they are. What is this whole world? And I was kind of blown away. So if they could do that with me, with zero investment into CrossFit as a consumer, then imagine what they do for the actual audience of CrossFitters who already has all of that context to play with, right? They are, to sum them up, the hardest working creatives I've ever known in my life. A lot of creatives will kind of split between I either I'm, I'm like the post guy and I'm all ethic and I have a hard time with like the creativity portion or I'm the creative guy. I'm late to every meeting and you're going to love me still because I drive the best ideas, but I'm not reliable. These guys are anomalies. They are absolute unicorns and I love them to death. I'm not being paid to say this. I would tell the truth if I didn't like them. They are geniuses and they're amazing to work with. and They're very hardworking. You're talking about guys who will go to the CrossFit games to live cover for their YouTube channel maybe get three hours of sleep a night, lead a group workout in the morning, go back to the game, start recording. In the meantime, I pull them aside to shoot a promo for us and they have smiles on their faces the entire time. They are genuinely good people. I really love them. So when we're thinking about cap table and splitting it between elite athlete and them, that's exactly why. It's like, that's the culture piece and then this is the prove it piece. And that's kind of how we're seeing it. Now that we've earned respect and name in CrossFit, there will always be a core group of people who are like, oh, it's Buttery Bros and Matt Fraser brand. But CrossFit, again, because I had no context, I'm a pretty regular consumption-driven guy. I like marketing and art and culture and things. And so, and I still didn't know this about CrossFit. Think about anyone else who's not doing marketing for a living and is not in that world at all. Like, they're probably going to be even less educated than I was. And so planning for that as the next steps of going, all right, what worked in CrossFit? How do we break into other categories now? We've earned this niche. We need to play defense here and still prove that we are who we are. We're built from within. But what are the next steps? Is It's really just a replication from there. It, it's going to be really exciting. I'm excited. So the only, the only person I can think of right now that kind of I can associate with how you described them was Gary Vaynerchuk, who I worked for for a long time. And it's just like, it's just a different kind of human being, you know, just like functions on a different level. Um, so that's awesome. I mean, when you find those people, like they are, like you said, they're the unicorns. So, um, cool. So let's talk about, I mean, you mentioned it already, kind of the importance of starting with a niche. I think I definitely want to get on cause I'm excited to hear about, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people would agree with that. I think few businesses do it as intentionally or as well as what you've done with podium. I think before we get there, you know, obviously sports nutrition, and I know the lifestyle element of it is part of how you're differentiating, but the product itself, I'm sure there are differences, but as a consumer of nutrition and supplements for a long time with sports and lifting and now CrossFit, it's hard often to find true differentiation at the product level. So a lot of it is the brand. So one, you can certainly tell me if I'm wrong, but two, how do you think about the importance of the brand and the marketing to creating differentiation in what is an incredibly crowded space. Like, I think nobody was sitting here thinking like, oh, we need another sports nutrition brand. But clearly there's demand that you've uncovered by what you're doing. So how have you approached that? So I'll say that, I won't say that you're wrong, but you're 90% right. <laughs> um, there is a little bit of, of tooling and formulation differences that you can get away with still. But for the most part, you're correct. It is a very crowded space for a reason. There's a lot of commands. There is a lot of demand. It's a very saturated market. Um, and a lot of guys think they're going to be the next ghost or C-bomb or whatever. And props, maybe they will be. That's awesome. I hope so. But with the rise of commands and the access to, uh, access to ingredients, it's pretty easy to start these brands. Um, how we are differentiated, I would say, is, uh, again, that lifestyle play is crucial. There are some formula differences that you can get away with. At the end of the day, like protein's protein, right? But is it an isolate? Does that isolate have something like a velocitol, like one of our SKUs of HWPO has, where it increases protein absorption? So you have less calories in and more protein absorbed. Like that's a good way to differentiate. But again, all of that's kind of a moot point with Podium, which is interesting. This is something I'm wrestling through right now as, as the leader uh, of marketing in this brand is we're not an education company. So even if I differentiate our products like that, it's really just in hopes that when we put it on a supplement nerds channel, they hype it up and we win those people over. They're important to win over, but I will never market Velocitol. That's not the brand voice. You know what I mean? It's just, it's truly not. Maybe if we trademarked our own ingredient, but even that is not a brand voice play. So 
that is kind of like a tricky thing with Podium right now. So at the end of the day, it's like we're selling, we're selling label. Any retailer meeting that we've had has been like the first sentence out of their mouth is either this tasted amazing or we love the label. Like those, those are really, and it sounds so superficial, but the amount of time that Paul spent with our design agency on this at the very beginning totally looks different. It's totally different. It really does. Like it just stands out. I think at Amazon right now, we're, we, for a while, we were like the number two creatine, um, at, like out of the gate. And, and there's no reason why I wasn't excessively spending. We weren't on promo. Uh, it's creatine. It's a commodity. It's like having a favorite gasoline. Probably the most commoditized within the category, like in terms of supplements. Yeah. And frankly, you could go to bulk supplements and buy a pillowcase of it for cheaper than any other brand out there. But I, th I mean, why wouldn't you? Except I love the brand, right? I think the differentiation is honestly in, in content and lifestyle after, after we release the product. So our, our product releases, what you'll notice is, this is actually super interesting. We have a 60-40 uh, male female split. That's very rare, very rare. Like I, I can't stress enough how bizarrely rare that is in the supplement industry because typically you either pink wash something and you focus on women only and apply pink tax to it, or you do like a bleeding gorilla beating someone to death on a tub of pre-workout and call it like max core 420 or whatever. And you sell it to 18 year olds and that's it. We took a very neutral approach to this, um, where it's it's like a fun kind of almost nostalgic but modern feeling brand, and we see a lot of split there, and it's very helpful in the retail conversations. Like, if you want to really make a buyer happy, show them your demos and prove to them that you really are a a household brand, not just a gender brand. Very very cool. So. I think where I want to go next is, so we kind of covered how you've started, how you've grown within CrossFit. Um, but obviously you have ambitions to go beyond that. And I know you're starting to think about that already now and making some moves. So before we talk about what you're doing, what have you seen work well and not well with other brands that have tried to start with a niche and then move on? You know, one of the relevant examples I know we touched on briefly in our prep call also from within CrossFit is Noble. Um, who were kind of on the rise. I know there's a lot of issues that they've had with like supply and things like that. It's not just about the marketing, but they did make a big investment in trying to jump to the NFL and sponsor the combine, which I think was like, you know, almost nine figures or something insane like that. So um, I'm not sure that they've really stuck the landing on that, let's just say. So maybe that's a bit of a cautionary tale, but what have you learned from like what other brands have done well or not done well when it comes to starting in a niche and trying to expand? Yeah, so uh, definitely a cautionary tale. Um, like at the end of the day, I think sometimes we glamorize simple human error because we don't want to admit that we can wake up and make a bad decision sometimes, even if we're 10, 20, 30 years into our career. I think the just as a, an aside to the noble point, I would love to look at that contract and know what were the service days, what were the stipulate, how many pieces of content were you promised, like who really dropped the ball? There's a better story in there somewhere. Something happened um, because the cost to return just didn't really make sense. Um, uh, anyways, I, I think, but it, what that spells though is is number one, human error exists when you're when you're niching out um, of something and you're branching out. The human error aspect can't be forgotten. Like you could just maybe sign the wrong deal or look into the wrong sport. So take your time, measure a few times before you make that cut. The next thing is authenticity, right? So we earned our authenticity, not just by buying partners as, you know, some people accuse brands of that. I, I think that's ridiculous and hokey. Like if, if there is synergy there and it's, and it's honest and you tell that story, then it's a really fun project, right? But we can't keep doing that. You can't just keep cutting up the cap table for every new sport you want to get into, right? You eventually have to be able to carry some brand equity in and show and show up and show out. So the example of how we're testing this right now, we're beta testing how we branch out uh, into the world of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So that's more of my world um, in the last few years. And I grew up doing it. And it's a highly athletic, underinvested in sport, which is actually the same story as CrossFit as far as sports nutrition goes. There was no dedicated brand in CrossFit for sports nutrition. And so when Paul saw that being, you know, the supplement guy that he is, he goes, boom, that's the next one. That's the next, that's the next opening that there is. These people are working their butts off and they're all buying from good brands. I'm not here to talk bad about other brands. There's 
on it. There's BPN, there's X Endurance, there's brands that, you know, were doing well in the space, but none of them were truly dedicated to CrossFitters and built for and by CrossFitters. And so we, we kind of differentiated from a product standpoint out of there and our fuse pre-workout is built for Metcon. It is a high stem, high focus. You're getting in there for an hour and a half and you want to give it all like fuse is for you. Our hydration product also has BCAAs in it. So we told this authenticity story of, we know what you need as an athlete because of your sport, because we're experts for this, because of X, Y, Z athlete or whoever. Now, as we move into other sports like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, we're experimenting with not only the athlete story, not on cap table, but on our roster. We're also experimenting with what works as far as events and showing up. And are we going to host seminars now with these? Every sport has its own thing, right? So maybe we host a Metcon at, at a number of different affiliates in CrossFit. But maybe for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's we take our world champion who we just signed, Fionn Davies, and we say, hey, we're going to do five seminars this year. And at each seminar, the we're going to pay the gym directly so that their members can show up and have the seminar for free. We're going to sample there. And then they're going to raffle off a free year long membership to a kid locally who needs it. Like you win community, everything else will fall in place, but you have to do it intentionally without the hope of like sales return in mind. The minute that you look like a brand that's just coming to take their score, you're going to get absolutely dumped on. Like people will not like you. And so as we're testing it in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, to me, in my opinion, it's an underserved community full of really great athletes. And I think it's on the rise and it's about to have a big, big media pop soon, probably from a brand like a Nike or a Reebok, um, to start signing these athletes to meaningful deals, having meaningful fights, but it's also low risk for us because of the lack of exposure. I can make my mistakes in this niche again, human error. I'm not above it. So I want to make my mistakes in this niche so that when we expand into surfing, we expand into snowboarding, we expand into different action sports or traditional Olympics we know we have a model without having athletes on the cap table to rely on. Hey everyone, just wanted to take a quick break because we've actually heard from many of you that you want to get a better understanding of what it is that we actually do as a business. You know us through this podcast, all the content that we put out, the events that we put on, the community that we have, the media company side of what we're up to here at Rival, but actually the core business just to kind of fill you all in, is we're a full-service marketing agency at this point. Obviously, we specialize in challenger brands. And what that means is that we work with either startups to help them scale and get to the next level, or we work with a lot of incumbents like Reebok, Unilever, JP Morgan to help them innovate or launch something new within the marketing function. We typically work across four main areas of the marketing department, brand and product positioning, creative ideation and production, paid media planning and buying, and customer data and marketing technology. We're also building some tech of our own, as you would have seen with Curo and also Enodo. So that's it. Just wanted to fill you all in since you've asked for it. And if you're interested in hearing more about what we're up to, please get in touch. But with that, I'll let you get back to the show. So uh, a couple of things I want to double click on within that. So you mentioned beta testing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. What does that approach look like? I mean, you mentioned like maybe you'll show up at a couple of events, but when you sit down with the team and you're like, great, we are going to beta test this new category. What is the playbook to test to know that it's something you should go into? You have to know your niche's pain points, right? You have to know your customer, your, your niche is your customer. So if, if your whole niche was grouped up into one customer personality, they have different pain points, right? Uh, for CrossFit, we know that coaching, for instance, is the pain point is they still have to buy their own supplements. Their, their gym doesn't always buy the supplements that they want. Our answer is rolling out a program for coaches where you get wholesale pricing. We limit you to three units a month. And there you go. We've just won over the culture. You're saving a ton of money and people are using our supplements and gyms and that matters, right? For Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu now, we're looking like, what's the pain point? Well, number one, it's money. Like the athletes just don't make enough to fully devote their time all the time. You have five-time world champions who are still having to kind of hustle to pay rent on the side. That's that's a problem. Um and the other thing is, I think, education of the quality of movement, right? So there's a lot of good gyms out there. There's also, you know, sometimes not good gyms, similar to any other niche. And so what we want to do is align ourselves with gyms that have a lot of renown and see if we can serve those communities with those free seminars. It sounds like a little thing. It's not just an event. It truly is like if you were to have a Metcon led by Matt Frazier at your gym, for instance, 
twice a year. Everyone and their mother would show up, be very excited, be taking notes. We want to lead Brazilian jiu-jitsu and any other market we enter by what's your pain point? How can we fix it authentically and ask for as little in return as possible? That ends up making you get the return that you want. That ends up giving you that viral audience and that trust. So those people will die for you. And um, to do it authentically is crucial though. So it starts with knowing the pain point. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's the way I think about, or it's a similar philosophy to how I think about doing all this content. You know, we spend, even I spend multiple hours every week. And then of course we have Veer in full time and, you know, um, an assistant producer and an external shop that does all the editing. Like it's a lot of time and money for a small business to go into producing all this content. Um, and it is genuinely about how do we add as much value as possible? Really the way I think about it and why Viren's title even is executive producer, not, you know, head of marketing is we're trying to build a modern media company around what we stand for. And for folks listening, you know, you would have heard me talk about this before, cause it's a big, it's a big one for me. It's probably first principle. Um, and I think that the biggest difference is just how you focus on the value exchange. I think traditional stereotypical marketing is about extracting value from the audience you're trying to reach. And if you're thinking like a media company, because your business model is based on attention, getting people to choose to spend time with you, with your content, at your events, within your community, when they have so many other options out there, you have to focus on adding value. In the long term, you know, you're not doing it as a charity. You're doing it because you genuinely believe that that will build your brand in a way that will drive the long-term growth of your business. But it really is a separate thing. It's not an equation of, oh, well, if I put out this podcast episode, I'm going to get a client there. You have to separate it in order to do it well. So I can totally relate to that. Um, and it really is. I, I think that's where a lot of good marketing comes from. You know, It comes from focusing on the customer, the job to be done, the need state that they have. I really like how you talk about the pain point, because I think that that compared to like the job to be done, which can be like a big heady thing at pain point is like, no, it's like the coaches have to buy their own supplements. It can be a very little thing, but getting in there, really understanding what they're looking for and being able to deliver value on it and doing that consistently over time. That's what built a great brand and business. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also having fun with it too. I mean, that I think is like part of a crucial part of the brand voice that we have and the success is we don't take ourselves too seriously. So after we've identified the pain point, after we've had these serious internal talks, we've built a real business model, then we can, then we can step forward and actually start entertaining people. And I think that's where, I think that's where a lot of brands who start maybe doing the right thing, that's where they stumble and fall again is back up for a second and think about real life. Tom on a Tuesday morning, who's getting ready for his accounting clerk job does not want to learn about the beneficial ingredients in our whey protein. He does not care. He opened Instagram because he's either on the toilet or in bed too long. And he just wants to laugh at something. Tom is no supplement nerd. <laughs> Tom, Tom doesn't care, dude. Tom has kids. Tom has a job. Tom wants to be entertained. And so I think like when we create content, I try to think about Tom a lot. Like I'm like, wh why, why would we sit here and talk about all these other things that the supplement nerds are already going to dig for and we already have backed up for and we built pages for them and we direct them to them that's awesome they're taken care of but like mainstream people people who are just like normal people that you're selling to the vast majority of the world they want to laugh they want to laugh and so i think every brand uh when i talk about humor i think we go over tin window sometimes and you think about like oh like wendy's on twitter we can never be them like i'm not saying to be wendy's on twitter i'm not saying that at all but what is interesting is that everyone knows what Wendy's on Twitter is, right? They're uh, abrasive and unhinged and fun. And so every brand is a personality too. So not just your cohort that you're chasing down, like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has a personality and a pain point. So does your brand. And if your brand can develop a full personality, so how would your local librarian make a joke versus your local trucker alone with his buddies? Two very different jokes, two very different languages, two very different approaches and delivery. Um, to very different audiences probably. And so when you're looking at your brand, you have to step back and go, okay, uh, let's say I'm selling hats. Like this hat brand, what, how, how, what actually do I want this voice to be? How does it actually live? How does it posture? Let's look at our customers. Let's look at everything and go, okay, I think this is how we will make our joke for this video. I think this is how we will take ourselves seriously when we need to. It's not a one a one rule fits all kind of thing. You have to look at your brand as a personality and go, well, how would this person operate with this group of people here? How would they tell this joke? And 
you have to understand it comes at a risk too. You're not ever going to be, you could be the only toothpaste brand in the entire world and your conversion rate would still probably be nowhere near 80% because people would make their own toothpaste. You will never be loved by everybody, right? And so I think once you get out of that trap, you can start having a little bit more fun internally with your with your campaigns and you will win. I think if brands focus on humor and just being normal and caring about Tom on a Tuesday morning, they will freaking dominate. I just realized we've already been going for almost 40 minutes. I had no idea. So um, I'm going to have to try to speed up the rest of this because we've gotten through like a third of what I wanted to ask you. But sign of a good conversation. I mean, I could also shut up more. I'll try to do that. Um, all right. So I think what I want to prioritize is... So we've talked about like going from niche to niche. You have an ambition to be the leading Olympic nutrition brand by the LA Olympics in 2028. That's not that far away. That's a big ambition. It's probably not going to come from like, you know, testing a couple events in a few different niche categories. Are you planning to kind of take big swings at some point? Or how do you see the growth that's going to need to accelerate if you want to accomplish that vision? We took a massive swing um, this year and it was... It was a foul tip is what I'll say. We connected and we were about to hit a home run and um, we didn't have NSF on our products. We have informed choice, informed sport. Here's the deal, man. I'm just going to tell everybody straight. All supplements are made in the same freaking factories and tested the same way. The mafia comes by and says, do you want our sticker? Great. Pay us X amount for SKU. Oh, you don't? Well, suck it. You're never going to be allowed to be in colleges or Olympic sports. That is the truth, everyone, okay? The brand you love is made at the same place the brand you hate, all right? So all that being said, um, we took a big swing and we barely missed. I mean, I we we were, were salading our way into just being like, can you still try? What about just hydration? We were so close and we would have been in the Olympics this year with a very meaningful athlete. And it would the content, the schedule, the service dates, Everything about this campaign would have been freaking fire, but it did happen. Uh, again, positive pessimist. I hope it's for a good reason. It's going to make me better on the next one, and we're going to we're going to update the products as needed. Um, but there is a strategy, and I think with Olympics, it's definitely reliant on athlete. It's definitely reliant on content. And frankly, I don't think there's any brands that are notable in the Olympics, including brands in our space currently right now, like Tier that are actually entertaining people. So the way that I want to tackle the Olympics is still the same as our brand heritage. We're efficable and we're entertaining. There's a lifestyle there. Athletes who don't take themselves too seriously have massive self brand spikes. People like them more. And for instance, the Kelsey podcast, it's just taken off, right? Um, those, those two guys are, are content geniuses. All they do is sit around and just be themselves and they're leveraging it correctly and they're having fun. If they were talking about the game and sports and taking it all seriously, they'd still have an audience, but it would not be as popular. And so our take on the Olympics is sign a good athlete, build a really aggressive content plan, shoot as perfectly as possible so you don't stress them out. You get the best bang for your buck and the service days are fun because that translates to your content and then edit a really good piece. And we're good at all of that stuff. So it's going to happen. There's so much good stuff in there. And I'd say anybody that's in this category um, CPG, but even others, like I'd just go back and re-listen to that two minutes because like there's a whole playbook, um, of how you build a modern brand, modern consumer brands, um, in there for sure. But in the interest of time, so we've talked a lot about kind of the approach and the brand. We haven't touched on distribution too much. Um, obviously D to C is clearly working for you. And as it says here in the show notes, you have a crazy low cost per acquisition, uh, through digital and social. But of course, you're also expanding into a large U.S. retailer that cannot be named at this point, but we're really excited for you about that. So two questions. Uh, your focus has been primarily on Instagram that's helping you drive that low customer acquisition through digital. So that's one. How, how are you approaching that and making that work? And then the other is, how did you end up getting the deal with the retailer? Like, what are they looking for and how did you approach landing that? Great two questions. So... I'll say you can never run away from, from CAC and ours is just taken on the chin at the cap table, right? So we leveraged athletes. We, we put Matt and buttery bros on there and that popularity has helped us surge. We, you know, when I first joined, I came, I used to own a, a dev and marketing agency. And so I had my old devs, uh, get hired on to build out our loyalty program. I focused on retention first not acquisition. Acquisition is pretty easy from a lever pull standpoint, creative standpoint. So I wanted to build the infrastructure first. We built a really aggressive loyalty program. 
Um, and we were able to massively drive down cost per acquisitions with the incentives of that loyalty program. And when we turned on the engines of spend, everything kind of fell into place. So that, that was really good. Um, the next portion for retail though, is, you know, it's interesting to see a brand like podium and that's like, it sounds so cliche and cheeky and weird, but like, really like there isn't a brand like us right now. We're not overboard on like gross humor. Um, or like, you know, kind of like, we're not, we're not cursing ever. We're also not like education first. And so I think retailers see that and they see something fresh and new. It honestly, uh, I'll say that anyone listening to this, who's in CPG already will know this, I hope. And anyone who's not should feel a little relieved and also a little more scared. Retail's easy to sell into, very easy to sell into. It's very hard to sell out of. So your, your focus in retail, when you have a relationship with a buyer, that is a very easy relationship to maintain and navigate and build trust with if your product is already good and you can prove it with your data. Like we talked about with that D2C growth, that helps us a lot. But at the end of the day, the buyer looks at our label and goes, oh, this is cool. I've never seen anything like this before. Every single time. So it's, it's not hard to win over a buyer at major retailers if you build for that success in the beginning, right? Build infrastructure, then turn on everything. And so that, that's kind of how we've sold in. Now, I will say for the major retail play, that one took about 18 months just because it resets and timing and making sure everything's there. But we will have five unique SKUs with this brand. We will be the only, with this retailer, we'll be the only supplement with the clean logo, if that gives any hints. And I think we're going to hit, I think we're going to hit it right on the bullseye. So I'm very, very excited about that. Wow. That's awesome, man. Congrats. All right. Lightning rounds. Can you tell us about the first marketing job you ever had? And I know that you didn't take a traditional route to being a CMO. So what was the first marketing job, if you want to count it as such? Yeah, I went from a construction site to running e-commerce for a fishing brand, like being like the e-commerce manager. That is a whole story in and of itself, but that is the truest, truest form of that story. And there's nothing sneaky about that. It was wild. I love it. Well, I went to music school and here I am hosting CMOs and talking half intelligently about marketing stuff. What's the best piece of career advice you've ever received? Uh, shut up and show up and over deliver. Honestly, it's so simple. I, it, and it sounds unfair. And it's not going to be everyone's favorite thing, but it works for a reason. It, whoever shows up, shuts up, and over delivers is always going to win. I mean, you could apply that to much more than marketing, that's for sure. What is the best brand campaign you've seen recently? Oh, my gosh. Honestly, Nike, believe it or not, with their kids' shoes, they're killing it. If you haven't seen it yet, they're rolling it out at a really healthy pace. That's, that's the key. They're not just going overboard a la Starry, if you've seen that soda everywhere now, and I'm, I'm, I fear for their spend. But like Nike is Nike is doing amazing things with their kids' shoe. The creative is genius for it. Talk about pain point. Oh, go look at that. Go do that. What is a marketing tool or resource that you cannot live without? My wife. That is not a cliche. She is our target audience most time, especially in the U.S. She's a pseudo crunchy mom with three kids that's kind of into homeschooling and still shops at Target and has mainstream style. She is like the, oh, I'm blessed to have that woman. What about Tom? What about Tom? What happened to Tom? I thought Tom was your <laughs> Tom, Tom, the fictional character that I think about. Yeah, he's cool too. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I, I do wonder, I'm, do you think that's had an impact on you being 60-40 male-female skew? I think so. I, I run mo most of my campaigns by my wife. And I also know that our founder, Paul, him and his wife talk about every campaign too. Um, yeah. What is the saying behind every great man is a greater woman or whatever. Wives are awesome. They are cool. Use them for work, I guess. That was a weird way to say that, but you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is one thing people should do differently after listening to this episode? Have more fun with your brand, please. I'm really, this is a, give me 10 seconds. I'm tired of everyone calling liquid death genius. I don't know why I take that personally because they're not genius. What happens is, is that they have creative people who are allowed to do whatever they want. And there's no stuffy PE guy telling them what to do. Like, oh, how do you think this will affect in Rojas? They're having fun and they're crushing it for that reason. So what is your brand's flavor of fun? Go do that. Be a complete personality, please. I love it. Lastly, who do you know that you should, that you think we should get on the show next? Ooh, that is a good question. 
I think the brand that I brought up in the beginning, you would have a blast with him from a culture like that rivalry kind of pillar that you have in the challenger pillar, I should say, that you have in, in your brand at Rival. Uh, the founder from LSKD, Jason. I would love to connect you with him. He could give a masterclass on culture and community and how that actually is worked out in a business model. It's really cool. Cool. I would love to do that. Um, you think Matt would? You think Matt would come on the show? Think he'd be into it? I could tell Matt to come on the show. He'd be into it. Yeah. He just did. He did. He did Rogan. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, like we're number two. We're right behind Rogan. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're challenging it for sure. <laughs> Dylan, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating conversation. I took a ton of notes and there's going to be a lot of stuff in my head and I'm going to, let's get podium into my gym over here. Um, I got to, uh, you got a new customer in the UK. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Shoot me an email. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Scratch is a production of Rival. We are a marketing innovation consultancy that helps businesses develop strategies and capabilities to grow faster. If you want to learn more about us, check out wearerival.com. If you want to connect with me, email me at eric at wearerival.com or find me on LinkedIn. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe, share with anyone you think might enjoy it, and please do leave us a review. Thanks for listening and see you next week.